Hello, I'm Bob the Booker and welcome to my channel. Uh, today I wanted to just wrap up the books I've read this week um, and it's been quite a fun one. Uh, just lots of, and this has basically been a little bit of a sandwich week almost between finishing reading the International Booker shortlist and before I start the Women's Prize shortlist. And so there are books in this um, in this wrap up that are not prize related too much um, ish and um, I'm, I've been really enjoying that. So uh, yeah, this is <laughs> this is just what I've needed. Um, so this has been a fun one. Before I kind of get back on my nonsense um, soon and start on that, but I thought it'd be fun to just wrap up all the books that I've been reading this last week. And um, it's also nice because I've been at my friend's uh, flat, and <laughs> he was very grateful that people were so in love with his uh, his decor. It is a beautiful flat. I uh, I am in. In sort of incredibly jealous um, of him and sort of very envious of all this beautiful design um, and I also love that people have picked up on the, the array of booze next to me uh, please uh, regular viewers please be um, please do not be concerned this is <laughs> this is more decoration at this point uh, in the sense that I haven't touched it um, since I moved in uh, so <laughs> there we go anyway enough about that let's get on with the books um, so first up uh, I wanted to go over um, uh, the book We Are Made of Diamond Stuff by Isabel Weidner and um, I really loved their book uh, Sterling Carat Gold which won the Goldsmiths last week uh, last week last year um, and um, also uh, really fun because she, uh, they, they were nominated again for the uh, Republic of Consciousness Prize um, and they didn't win um, although I wish they had um, in many ways. I was kind of rooting for, for them in that list I think. Still a really fun shortlist and I did a separate video about that shortlist uh, but the, the winner was Happy Stories mostly by Norman Eriksson Pasarivu and translated by Tiffany Tsao and a, a, a well-deserved win I think even though I was I was rooting for um, for Isabel Weidner. Anyhow, We Are Made of Diamond Stuff is a uh, is a book that came out before um, Selling Carrot Gold but has been re, uh, republished and, and part of that republishing has just been to also give it this really cool cover to match uh, Stella and Carrot Gold but I, um, I, I really found this quite a profound and interesting book. It's very very small um, and in typical Weidner style is just kind of wild. I think there's a quote on the back by Guy uh, Garat, um, Gunaratne where he talks about how there is no single sentence in this book that is ordinary <laughs> and that is I mean that's peak Isabel Weidner really um, but the sentences just bounce and at first you have no real idea what's going on but overall this book ends up being quite an interesting discuss discussion about the idea of national identity um, and what it means to be in a place so we have characters right at the beginning who um, are worried about their their citizenship status um, in the UK and particularly given Brexit and a few other things those sort of questions loom large over the book uh, but also there are quite a few things in here about borders so lots of characters sort of traveling towards these areas that are between Britain and France and this idea of what makes a nation a nation what is your nationality how do you prove that what's the sort of state-sponsored version of proving who you are um, and so yeah a, a wild kind of romp through that it's Isabel Weidner is really hard to pin down because their writing is just so like off the wall but what I really appreciate about this book is how it 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 seems at first like it's just going to be a bit zany but it has a really important point at the heart of it as well Next up I read the Heartstopper books which I did a separate video on so I'm not going to go into them in too much detail but that was an absolute joy to read. Um, that felt like the almost the definition of sort of pleasure reading just because it's so easy and light in so many ways to, to read through. Um, it's lots of pretty pictures as well <laughs> so it was useful on days when I, I wasn't necessarily feeling too too much reading. Um, but then I read a few other books uh, that I greatly enjoyed. Um, all my little library loans that I need to give back. Um, so uh, the first of these was um, uh, Auguries of a Minor God by uh, Nidhi Zak Arya Iper. Um, and this is a collection of poems but particularly in many ways it's only really about 12 or so poems because the vast majority of this book is two longer poems. One of which um, goes through a cycle um, of alphabet 
um, alphabetically ordered lines almost. So a group of lines of poetry that begin with the letter A and then B and blah, blah, blah. And I think it stops at O <laughs> um, or thereabouts, yeah. And what I thought was so, I mean, it was really interesting and really fun. And I love the way that um, they put this together to kind of slowly lean in, lead up to this and kind of create this, this thing. Particularly as that kind of cycle of poems really looks at um, religion and God and uh, it sort of almost at times feels like Bible verses or, or Quranic verses or, or, you know, from any religious text. They have this kind of scriptural quality to them. And at times I really loved that and thought it was really clever and powerful. And at times, particularly as I had this as an audiobook, it did feel like I was listening to somebody reading a religious text. And um, that wasn't always the most interesting or exciting thing for me. But I also get that there's sort of something quite interesting going on there because, you know, in many ways, um, parts of the Quran, for example, are often read out almost as poetry. You know, they're kind of, they're recited in a poetic way as opposed to, you know, a, a prayer or, or whatever else that might be a little bit more static is not the word, but you know, they're, they're not necessarily written to, to kind of have an internal melody or, or whatever. Um, and so I, I see that there's something quite clever going in, and this book was a uh, shortlist of a prize, uh, which is how I kind of heard about it, the, the Dylan Thomas uh, prize. Um, and I, I didn't fully get on with it. I think I, there were some poems in this that I thought were beautiful. Um, and I think the two sort of, well, the big kind of centerpiece of that poem, I think I didn't really get on with, and that sort of shaped my enjoyment of the rest of the, the book, unfortunately. But I still think it's well worth checking out, um, just not necessarily my, my thing. Next up, um, I read a few other books that I had on loan from the library. Um, one of these was Fairyland by Alicia, uh, Alicia Abbott. And this is essentially a memoir of um, a girl who grows up with a father who is, um, well, he, he, for most of the book, she sort of refers to him as bisexual. She sometimes refers to him as gay. It's sort of a fairly fluid identity, it seems. But essentially, you know, he loved um, her mother passionately and deeply after his after his, uh, her mother's death um he mostly was with men um and and so she sort of she sort of varies in how she calls him throughout the book but the fairyland really looks at this sort of complicated relationship between a father and daughter particularly where the daughter is not only suffering the loss of her mother but is also trying to understand and navigate her father's relationships with other people particularly with men and understand what it's like when you know he, this is also during uh so this is in sort of san francisco for large parts of this during the 70s and 80s which is you know a really big time for queer activism but also especially when we come to the 80s a really big time for um for the AIDS crisis as well and so this really complicated thing of trying to manage her relationship with her father but at the same time when he um, when he becomes HIV positive there is a sort of a change in this relationship to some degree because she suddenly starts worrying a bit more about his mortality as well and realizing that she is going to be um, potentially parentless um, at a fairly young age um, so really, really beautiful observations throughout, I thought. This is just a, a really lovely little memoir. Um, it's it's messy and complicated. Their relationship is incredibly rich and, and varied, and there's a lot of distrust and dislike at times. You know, the father sometimes feels that he has, you know, he writes these diaries and he sometimes feels that his daughter is out of control, um, as I'm sure many parents of teenagers probably feel. Um, and she reads these diaries later and kind of, both sympathises and doesn't in various ways as well, which I thought was really interesting. Um, next up, I read a book that uh, I think someone had suggested in the comment ages and ages ago, and I apologise, um, I cannot remember exactly who it was, but I, um, I'm really glad that I finally read it after like six months or whatever it was. And that's Miss Jane by Brad Watson. Um, and this is a story um, about a young woman who basically grows up with some kind of medical issue that basically means that she is um uh, she's sort of for the most part kind of incontinent um because it sort of affects her genitals as well she's sort of she's incontinent and sort of her parents basically set her up to to know that she's never really going to have children and probably as a result due to the time that she's in and sort of 
um, you know, sort of 100 or so years ago, I think it was. Um, yeah, 20th century rural Mississippi. Um, it also means that um, there's a fear about her actually being married and, and what have you and, you know, attracting male suitors. Um, and she is sort of this extraordinary character of this young woman who has this real inner strength but is really battling sort of so much around her. Um, and what I found really quite profound about it is she has this really kind of steadiness when everybody else around her is sort of falling apart. She's the one who almost should fall apart more than anybody else. She's the one dealing with something quite traumatic. Um, but she sort of holds it all together and at the end it's almost this sort of Jane Eyre style thing of um, this character who is, I mean I think that's part of the relevance, I think it's meant to be like a, a subtle reference to that I think, it felt like it, um, of sort of at the end she's the one who inherits money and suddenly has the control and power to be able to do some of these things as this woman in sort of older life um, with power suddenly in a, in a society that doesn't necessarily give women that much power. Um, so I thought it was really, really beautifully done um, and really powerful. And she even sort of has these little moments of kind of getting her own back on people around her as well, which I found quite interesting. Next up, I read uh, Since I Laid My Burden Down by Brontes Purnell, um, published by Cypher Press in the UK, um, who are great, the sort of indie, small, queer press. And um, they, I, I read 100 Boyfriends by him before, um, and uh, in many ways sort of very uh, sort of similar overall but this is more of a novel as opposed to sort of the memoir that 100 Boyfriends was and um, this sort of follows a, a young boy, it's quite short and it's told in this sort of very quick style um, of just this sort of young man growing up realising his sexuality but kind of watching the world around him sort of fall apart, you know, people dying and, and what have you but almost his sexuality is this sort of constant through it, you know, his sort of ability for people to find him attractive and for him to find others attractive seems to be the kind of continuity and we sort of see what happens when that's the kind of main thing in his life that other things might fall through in the sense that you know if his if his only sense of reassurance or identity is coming from sexuality it can feel quite hollow at times but I think this book also avoids that feeling like always necessarily the worst thing and is very very sex positive and it's very um open in the way it approaches so many of these things. So I found this book really quite engaging and quite fun and again it's a really quick read um, but I know he's got another book coming out this year as well also through Cypher Press and um, also with these very cool cover designs um, and yes yeah, so I'm intrigued to read it. Um, I, I will say sort of I was sort of fully I was held off from it being like a fully realized sort of five stars or whatever for me just because I think um, I at times wanted it to just dig a tiny bit more but I, I did find it really engaging and interesting nonetheless. So next I recorded um, a section talking about this book um, and it ended up being like seven minutes and I feel like that's maybe too much within a weekly roundup. Um, so I might do it as a separate thing. But I just wanted to quickly uh, talk about this book, uh, Lacuna by Fiona Snickers. Um, and this essentially is um, a a rewriting or a writing back rather to Disgrace by J.M. Curtsy um, and um, without going into too much detail because that's how I ended up talking about it for seven minutes the, the key premise is that a woman uh, Lucy ha has been sexually assaulted and her story has become big news that big news at least in the the realm of this book um, then inspired J.M. Curtsy to write Disgrace he writes this book, Disgrace wins the Booker Prize, which it did in 1999. Um, Curtsy becomes a household name and she feels like her story has been stolen from her. And everybody she meets says, oh, you know, you're that woman and that thing happened to you. Um, they know her as the girl from, uh, from Jane Curtsy's book. And she finds that incredibly difficult, but at the same time, this book is also a tricky and slippy one because it is basically dealing with her also as an unreliable narrator. There are some factual inconsistencies as in the, the opening page of the book talks about this being Curtsy winning his first major literary prize. He won the Booker Prize some sort of 15 or so years earlier. Um, so this was his second win. He was already a bit established. He'd won other prizes. 
Um, and the book also has her almost sort of fixated on her hatred for um, uh, for Curtsy, um, as in she feels her, her stole, story's been stolen, but also she's so unreliable as a narrator throughout the book where in various moments she'll talk about something and then we'll realise that she's made that up. She'll freely admit it. She'll say, I spoke to my therapist about this. We'll hear the therapist's conversation with her. And it's wildly not how a therapist would talk to a patient, or at least you hope. And um, then she'll sort of say, yeah, I did make that up. But in doing so as well, also throws it up this really interesting discussion about how we as a society treat women who tell their stories um, about sexual assault. Um, that often women are not believed and so we have a narrator who is really slippery and unbelievable but also we do have to recognise that so much of what she says could also be true and so there's this really fine line of how much of the unreliable nature of this book is true and how much of this is a result of trauma where she's almost dealing with her trauma by fixating on one person who she hates, and that is Curtsy for stealing her story. And so much of the book deals with this idea of what's true, what's not. It's a really intense book. Um, it's very short as well, it's about 200 pages, but incredibly intense. Um, and I'm intrigued to hear people's thoughts on it, just because I think it, it's a, it, a, a whole dissertations I think could be written on this because I think there's so much in there. Um, but also I, at times, I don't know if I necessarily liked the added layers of complexity. Sometimes I felt like that took away from what could be a really profound story in some other ways. So at times I felt like those, because it was like layer upon layer upon layer upon layer. And at times it just sort of felt a bit strange because I'm like, I don't know if I'm hating Curtsy in this book legitimately. I don't know if the uh, inconsistencies and factual errors are the authors or the narrators and it's it got a bit messy in that sense yeah a tricky and slippery book and i i really want to hear some of the discussion on it as well a couple of the other arcs i read were um around poetry mostly so i read paul trans um the flower um all the flowers kneeling um which i thought was really quite beautiful in terms of how it again looks at kind of queerness and sexuality and gender and violence and power and sex and kind of merges all of them into these things. So you've, get, you've got these really brutal moments, but that are kind of, where well, there's a, a real overlap between sort of sex and violence. Um, and some of those poems I found really, really powerful. And for me, they reminded me of some of the poets I love, uh, like um, Andrew Macmillan or Ocean Vuong. Um, but then at times I sort of felt like it didn't always fully hit the mark for me, but overall I think as a collection I really, really um, enjoyed it. And on a similar note, mentioning Andrew McMillan, he and Mary Jean Chan um, have created this set of, uh, this, this um, uh, compilation or collection of poems called 100 Queer Poems. I don't know why it took me so long to think of the word for that. Um, 100 Queer Poems, and like the title says, it's just sort of taking various poems from across the, you know, across the world, across various genres and, 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 and looking at basically, yeah, presenting a bit of a compendium of where are we so far, um, what poems are out there. And this is sort of almost a, a recreation of a similar um, compilation that was done years ago. Um, and it's sort of a way of looking at the modern state of poetry, but bringing in a few influences and everything from elsewhere. And I found it a really beautiful collection because there are some uh, really, uh, really powerful poets um, and poems that are that I hadn't heard of before. A few people who are in this compilation who I know and love, um, but some new exciting ones as well. Um, and it's it's a really truly kind of global way of looking at it, and particularly looking at various different identities within the the LGBTQ plus spectrum um, as well. So yeah, really well worth checking out. I believe it comes out in June. Um, anyway. That's been a lot of me talking. Um, really intrigued to hear some of your thoughts if you've read any of these books. Um, I've been Bob, the booker are talking about all of these. Um, I hope you've had a good reading week and speak to you all soon. Bye bye.